if you're watching this live now, then uh, you get you get the the benefit of uh, of hearing the little pre-show here. We've we've got um, lots of folks hanging out in the chat room. It is so good, so good to be with you live here on YouTube. Got some questions pulled up from some folks over in the 52 Qs community who might not be able to be including this gif, uh, this gif of David Hasselhoff, which is just peering into my soul. What is happening, everybody? This is Dave Croft, and welcome back to another episode of the 52 Q's podcast, a weekly podcast dedicated to all things production and library music, where we talk about industry topics and um, chat about uh, the aspects of being a working production music composer. If this is your first time here, welcome. Whether you're watching on YouTube or listening to this audio podcast on the go, and if you're watching on YouTube, then maybe you might be catching this live i just want to thank you for spending the next uh, next a uh, little hour or so of your of your day with me today uh, before we get started i have to give a special word of thanks to the family friends and patron subscribers of 52 cues who help keep the podcast the channel and everything going uh, if you like what i do here don't thank me thank them and many of them are here in the chat right now uh it's a you can thank them uh but if you want to learn more about how you can help support 52 two cues and also unlock extra subscriber perks like live streams, Zoom sessions, workshops, and a ton more. Be sure to click on the links in the description because uh, we would love to have you. We would absolutely love to have you. <laughs> Oh, so folks in the chat, these these are these are all my friends. Dex is like boring. Less, yeah, we are live. It is so good. We are hanging out live for a very very special live Q and A episode. We're going to be taking questions from YouTube. We're going to be taking questions from folks over in the 52 Qs community, and we'll go for about an hour, an hour or so. And Andrea says the universe has amazing plans for you. Uh, I could uh, I could uh, do a live with Dave. Heck yes. Oh, Dex. Oh, I know. I know. You pull the pigtails or the beard of the one you love, Dex. All good. I have come to appreciate your sense of humor, and uh, and I think I think we vibe on the same on the same wavelength. So, like I said, we're going to be going for about an hour or so here. It's really good to to be with you. And uh, I, I'm really, really excited to be doing these live Q and A's. And depending on how it goes today, we'll, we're going to be doing these kind of regularly. I like the idea of some live interaction uh, with some YouTube folks, maybe some folks who are watching live who aren't members of the 52 Qs community. To join the community, it's free. Uh, you don't have to be a paid subscriber, but if you do, you know, then you get tons of extra. But we would love to absolutely love. To, to have you. Uh, let's see. Andrea says, uh, caught, uh, I, I caught a live with Dave. Yes. Yes. And so uh, I love the live interaction. All right. So live Q and a, I haven't read most of these, but I want to go ahead and start with some Q and a's from some folks over in the uh, 52 Q's community and Ilya. What is good, Ilya? I hope you're doing well. Ilya has a question. I don't know what I'm going to do about this David Hasselhoff, like peeking up over the bottom. All right, so I'm just going to scroll that down. A question about royalties. When something gets played on streaming platforms, depending on the agreement, does the composer see anything in terms of royalties? And how do they even track all of that? Also, how does old-fashioned TV uh, reruns work? Like if I made the theme for Knight Rider, assuming everything is done correctly on the business end, I would see residuals even when they, they play it now in 2023. Hashtag love the Hoff. Well, the, two separate questions here. And the first question uh, has to do with... Um, with streaming royalties. And sadly, streaming royalties right now are like pennies to the dollar, not even pennies, just fractions of pennies to the dollar. And, and part of the reason is, this is my understanding, I am not a lawyer, nor am I an accountant, nor am I a royalty specialist. However, my understanding is, is that because the, um, the FCC or because the industry doesn't require streaming services to report their royalties the same way they require terrestrial broadcasts. We are 
at their mercy. Like whatever they want to tell us, however the ratings are calculated, that's what we are kind of just stuck with. And ratings, how many eyeballs are seeing a thing that gets on TV, that really, really matters. And so if you get something on network TV or even cable, they are required either by the government or by the performing rights organizations, whoever has forced them, they, they publish their numbers. We know how many things get seen. But for streaming, because the laws and the, the policies and procedures haven't caught up with it, we, we basically just take their words for it. Now, I think the PROs, the performing rights organizations, I think Congress or whoever needs to make them, the streaming royalty, the uh, streaming companies, report on how many eyeballs are seeing, uh, are seeing the shows. And because we're just taking their word for it, it's, it's fractions of pennies to the dollar, and they really, really stink. This is part of the reason that the writers and the actors are on strike right now, because the streaming platforms are paying peanuts compared to how royalties worked previously, which takes me to your second question. And your second question was, um, uh, if you made a theme and it gets rerun, uh, do, do, do you see royalties? If you got a, a theme for a TV show like Knight Rider, <laughs> then, um, then you would see royalties. You would see residuals every time it gets played. Composers' royalties and actors' residuals, mm, they're, they're really cut from much the same cloth. So uh, the writers and actors are, are striking for this very thing right now because of this. And so if you got a theme, then every time it played, you would see, you would see a back end on it. That would be the goal. But the streaming services, we just... We just hope they're right, and um, it's not great. It's really, really not great. And this is Apple TV. This is Hulu. This is Netflix. This is Spotify. This is Apple Music. Any of those streaming royalties, they, it's not great. But it, if the business is done right, like you said, across the business end, if it's done right, then you would see residuals no matter how many times it, it reruns. Because every time it plays, you get paid. I still receive royalties from the first season of, of Temptation Island that I had music placed on, even though it's been several years. Parenthetically, I often make more royalties from an episode of Temptation Island than I do like a Final Four placement on the NCAA on CBS. Because the NCAA tournament airs once, but... Temptation Island gets rerun across multiple networks. It's showed up on, I think, like in-flight in -flight TV, <laughs> like on Delta and all of that stuff. So uh, so that's, that's a real challenge. That's a real challenge. So Ilya, I hope that helps. Thank you so much for sending that question along. And I, I've got to get, uh, I've got to get David Hassel off, off my screen. Uh, let's see some folks in the chat. Uh, um, yes, Reed says, don't forget to smash that like button. Yeah, 100%. Uh, Bo says, I'm a full sale student. You taking attendance? I don't know. If you're 50, if you're more than 15 minutes late, that's two hours out, man. You got to take it up. Uh, and um, uh, Bo said, BMI and ASCAP just changed their fees to joint. Did they? I did not know that. I know BMI just announced getting sold to a private equity firm. Now, I would hope. I would hope that there would be some kind of pay it forward, dare I say, trickle down effect, even though that didn't work, work out too well for everybody in the 80s. But, um, but I would hope that that means a good thing. I'm with CSAC and CSAC is privately owned and they do pretty well. But if, if all of the CEOs of BMI are, are banking a ton of money and the composers and songwriters and authors, they get hosed. I don't think that's really great, but Dex is right. We're not quite sure what they mean, what that means for composers yet. I am cautiously optimistic based off of my own experience with, um, my own experience with CSAC. Yeah. But I think it has officially been sold. I believe, I believe. Yep. For sure. 
All right. So uh, for you live folks, remember, you can always ask questions. Just uh, pop those into the chat and I will make sure to jump on board. But next up, we have Doug. Doug, what is good, my man? Doug asks, what's the best way to set optimal loudness levels when mastering with ozone? Now, I don't know if this is the best way, but this is the way that I do it that works pretty well for me. And I have a cue, uh, cue pulled up here. This is called Indict for Sore Eyes. <laughs> uh, and it, it, it is a, a pulsing tension cue. And what I do, because production music tends to be, um, not, it doesn't have huge uh, dynamic swings in general. What I tend to do is find the loudest sustained portion of the cue, the loudest sustained phrase of the cue. Typically, that's going to be somewhere towards the end, like the final phrase leading into that final button. And so this cue is kind of kind of cooking along the whole time. You know, it has a, I have a chord change. Then it goes into a breakdown. Right, so it's kind of building and then coming down and then building again. Miss Juju Beats says, I put a question in the Composer Cafe or should I add it here? I would I would probably add it here or add it to the event over in the 52 Qs. The, um, this event here, the event with this here. And I'll refresh that to make sure. All right, so we're coming down out of our breakdown here. And we're going to go into our loudest portion. And I tend to isolate the loudest sustained phrase of the cue. And I do 90 to 95% of my mastering from this spot. And then um, I got to tell you, I've been using uh, Ozone 10 and Ozone 10, it's mastering assistant does really, really well. Uh, and so I use it and then I add some extra, some extra something, something uh, to help out. A lot of times what it will do is it will just blast the loudness, like really, really loud. So I, um, I don't, I, I don't keep that, um, but it does a really good job uh, in general and I pick the loudest spot of the cue. And I will kind of futz around if I'm using the mastering assistant with a, a, a preset that kind of works rock versus uh, cinematic. I al don't always take it, its word for it, but I will add an EQ. I'll add my own EQ, set it to mid side. And in the mids, I will scoop out right around 3K or so where dialogue likes to sit. Boost up the lows and that's the mids. And then in the sides, I will offset what I just scooped out. So I will do a boost at 3K and then, and then work on the lows to make sure I don't have any real low lows in the sides. All right, this is, this is a way of, of getting mid, high mids out of the way of dialogue. And then I adjust the limiter. I shoot for, uh, I don't know, anywhere between minus 14 to minus 12 uh, luffs. Just really depends on, on how loud the library is asking for and that kind of thing. And so and I've done a lot of comparisons of my own mastering process, some of which I've talked about here on the YouTube channel, some of which I've, I've done during live workshops. But this mastering assistant, I keep coming back to it. It's not bad at all. Uh, and so uh, I start with that and then go from there. You can see I'm getting into a minus 14 luffs and, uh, and that tends to help out. And as long as you're isolating the loudest sustained phrase of the cue, then it tends to give me pretty good readings. Now, what can be different with this is if you're dealing with a trailer track especially a trailer track, which uh, might start off super quiet and get giant loud. That's that's a little bit different and kind of goes into this next question that I will talk about here in a second. All right, so Jerome asks, let me see, let me pull up uh, 
Let me pull up uh, Jerome. Oops, there we go. Um, Jerome says uh, the, the, the 52 Q's weekly videos of one Q each week are mostly missing from YouTube. There's only like seven of them. They were really helpful. Any chance of getting them back? Do you mean um, the weekly videos of one Q per week? Do you mean the Q breakdowns? Is that what you're, is that what you're talking about? Because the Q breakdowns have, uh, have moved and they're actually a, a friend's benefit now, um, where I do a weekly breakdown of the, um, of, of, of a Q that I wrote, if, if that's what we're talking about and they live over here into the Q breakdowns. Yeah, it was a couple of years back where, where I did a, um, where I did like, this is an ominous tension cue and that kind of thing. Yeah, it, it's actually a benefit uh, for uh, the Friends subscribers. And so uh, that that's where they live. That's where they move to. Yep, they're all, they're all right there. I've thought about releasing, um, releasing like really, really old ones, you know, and kind of backfilling and doing maybe one a month. Um, but I want to make sure that at least for a, a year, like the folks who are friend subscribers have kind of first, but, um, but yeah, that, that's, that's where they, uh, that's where they, they have all gone to. I'm not trying to gatekeep anything, just trying to add value to the friends subscription. So, so yeah, I hope that answers your question. Um, uh, Les asks, is there a playlist for the Q breakdowns? Uh, no, there isn't, but they, they're individually uh, posted there in the, um, in the 52 Qs. Q breakdown section for the, uh, the, it's the friends and family subscribers. It's part of, of the benefits of those folks. Yen, Yen said, asked that question. All right. Uh, Miss Juju Beats asks, how important is sound design in a Q? Is it important to have your Q stand out with sound design? That is a fantastic question. Uh, and is something that I talked about with, Venus Theory, um, um, Cameron Gorham, aka Venus Theory, on an interview. And I want to thank Nigel. Shout out to Nigel, who really helped coordinate that interview. Um, thank you very much. Uh, but that is coming up very, very soon. Have, I just need to, to find a spot. A lot of interviews that I've recorded that I haven't released yet. Um, it just takes, uh, just takes time. I don't, I don't want to do an interview every single week. So uh, I have to kind of spread them out. I was doing them once a month, but I have so many, it would be until like March uh, before, um, before, they, before they all got out. So it's once every two to three weeks. Um, his, his takeaway is, and I agree with it, is that as music composition and sound design merge, like the sense of what is musical composition is morphing. And we can maybe thank Hans Zimmer for that or whatever, but sound design, I don't think, I don't think composers can be completely ignorant of sound design like we once were. The job of the pencil onto staff paper sitting in front of a piano and handing it off, I think that I think those gigs are gone, especially. I mean, they never really existed for us production music folks anyway, but um but uh, they, they don't really, they're, they're not really a thing. So if you're wanting to get into, especially games, film scoring, then sound design becomes a, thing, uh, a, a real need. Uh, the other thing that sound design enables you to do is craft your own sound. One of the things that Cameron talks about uh, in his interview is, you know, making cues and every single sound is created from scratch. So you know that the sound that you are using isn't just a preset off the shelf, isn't just a plug-in, but is something that you crafted. And if we are to believe, which I do, but if we are to believe that creativity, uniqueness, and originality are, are going to become increasingly valuable commodities in production music, then I don't think, I don't think we can avoid sound design which means getting your hand on some synth, getting something like this, right? Just getting a, this is a uh, uh, Zoom HN1. Go record some sounds, bring them into a synth, make your own pads and, and make your own 
bell sounds and that kind of thing. So I don't think we can really avoid that. Um, other questions from the chat. Um, let's see. Uh, things are scrolling by faster than I thought. Uh, let's see. That was Miss Jujubees. Uh, I was wondering after viewing your queue and review of the Reason's new mo uh, module object, I thought the module added something special and noticeable. 100%. And that was just an off the shelf, uh, off the shelf thing. And so, yes. Uh, Reed says, uh, how often do I use reference track feature on Ozone 10? These days, not really often. Uh, but when I first started using Ozone, I used it religiously. Probably used it for... Wow, two two to three years solid. Put put a um, sorry, I was reading the chat. Uh, two or three years solid. I would bring reference, and I thought it was really helpful, especially especially early on. It helped me learn ozone, and it um, it taught me a lot. You know, so I would bring in a track, and I would I would use the EQ match, and then figure out okay. How, why is this sounding the way it is? You do that enough, you just learn. You just like learning new headphones or whatever. You just learn what works and what doesn't. Um, I, to be honest, I don't remember the last time I used it, but I used it religiously when I first got it. First got it. Uh, Dex asks, or uh, Dex says, um, I was wondering, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I found myself using Ozone, then adding the default adaptive limiter to logic to get a minus one dB. Interesting. Yeah, I found I find that with uh, with Ozone, if I just set um, the maximizer here and set my ceiling to minus one, as long as it's the last thing in the chain, it does really, really well. It does really, really well. So again, yeah, set my ceiling to minus one. And that helps out. That helps out a great deal. Um, let's see. Um, Nigel asks, uh, you often talk about uh, artist versus artisan approach. Um, how, how we don't make 100% art. Has that changed with the advent of AI? And will libraries evolve to seek more artistic, unique sounds slash music? This is a great question. It's a really great question. And something, and something that, that the last year has kind of challenged my own take on this. But for me, being an artisan isn't about isn't about mass producing it isn't necessarily about creativity it's about the mindset of what you're making and making sure that what you're making has use to someone else that you're not making something for yourself you're making something that somebody can use now what's been really interesting and I think exciting is over the last, wow, over the last year, especially, but over the last um, amount of time, libraries seem to be searching for more unique voices from production music composers for whatever reason. Could be AI coming and chomping at our heels, Langoliers style. Or it could be that channels just like this one <laughs> and, uh, and Clint's and Eric's and Stephen Bedall's and Jesse's and all, you know, the, the, the usual cast, cast of characters, us folks, production music folks on YouTube having courses and discords and communities, production music's not a secret anymore. It's not, you know, this underground thing. It's pretty mainstream. I mean, we have, we have, uh, uh, 3,300 and so subscribers and that's not giant, but it's only production music here. Jesse Josephson's channel has sync, synced my music has, you know, tens of thousands of subscribers. So word is out, but that also means that I think the lowest hanging fruit, which is either going to be gobbled up by AI, which I think it will. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm looking at you like Pond5 and yeah. But also the mass produced, just crank it out, crank it out, crank it out. I don't think, I don't think so. Think of it this way. I am an artisan looking to sell 
at a farmer's market. I'm not an artisan looking to sell to Walmart. Pond 5 is the Walmart of production music. And Walmart needs to exist. I am not hating on Walmart. I am not disparaging the Walton family. But if I was an artisan baker looking to to fulfill an order from a Walmart, I'm going to look to cut corners, to mass produce, to assembly line things. And that's fine. That's That's not what I'm doing. But artisan brain, for me, is much more about the mentality when you set out to write something. But to your point, I think libraries are seeking more unique sounds. Yep. I think I think that's true. All right, Greg had a question. Uh, Greg's question was, uh, follow up from your drum programming workshop. Can you go over ride in, out, edge, and bell and how I use all of those. Well, I don't have a drum set up. Um, right in, out, edge, and bell, and how I use all of those. When you say right in, how, how, how do you mean? Like when, when to use the ride symbol? My, um, my, my, my old drummer brain tells me, use the ride symbol on the chorus and or the bridge. You go to the ride, hi-hats are for verses, ride symbols are for the bridge. Um, yep. Oh, that's Logic's Pro categories. Uh, be, uh, so uh, use the, the, so that's when I bring a ride symbol in. Um, as far as the edge, that would be like, I use it as an, an additional crash symbol. But because uh, ride symbols are typically thicker, they don't open up as quickly and they tend to be a little bit more bongy, just roary and bongy, right? And so uh, I will use it as a lower volume crash. Like here, here behind me, that is a, uh, that's a point to it. That's a 22 inch Karope symbol, uh, Karope ride. And that is an 18 inch crash. Now I can ride on that. But I don't, I crash on the 21 every now and then, but it's not my main crash back there. Uh, as far as the bell, I'll use those for accents. Uh, if I'm doing like a funk thing, uh, and then uh, I will do, you know, bell, tip, bell, tip, ding, ding, bang, ding, 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 ding. Or if I'm doing off beats, ding, 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 ding. Um, but you got to use sparingly. A little bit of ride bell goes a long way, goes a long way. I, I hope that helps, Greg. I hope that helps. Uh, I, I don't have a, uh, I don't have a, a, a session pulled up with that. So I, and I'd, I could get, get into the weeds trying to pull something up really super quick. Let's see. Uh, some other folks from the chat. Uh, Shane says, any thoughts on overcoming the obstacle or fear of submitting works to the libraries? Sometimes the composing process is the easiest part. Putting your work in front of others can be stifling. Well, I was talking to somebody recently and we were talking about this and about how you kind of, you can get really beat up. And here's, a, here's, here's an analogy. You know me, I'm Captain Analogy. So here comes another analogy, everybody. Fear of rejection and being, being afraid to hear no or hear nothing from a library is like being a boxer expecting not to get hit in the face. Being afraid of getting a return, whether it's taxi or whether it's a, an email, unsolicited, whatever. Reject, being afraid of rejection in the creative arts is like being a boxer of, and being afraid of getting hit in the face. It's just part of it. And, and the gig isn't don't get hit in the face. And I think we kind of fall into that trap. You know, don't get hit in the face. And so you bob and weave, right? (laughs) Boxers bob and weave, not to avoid getting hit in the face, but minimize. They are going to get hit in the face. You're going to get punched. But the real sport is 
how many blows can you give back while taking the hits in the face, taking the body blows and all of that. That's, that's the game. So if you're afraid of rejection, then um, don't, don't try boxing. I guess I've never been in a boxing ring before. I'm just assuming, but um, boxers train on, on how to take a, how to take a punch. Doesn't make it hurt less, right? When a boxer takes a, a hook to the face, it still hurts. You know, if you cut me, do I not bleed, right? It still hurts. But their focus isn't on the rejection. Their focus is on, okay, I gotta, I've got to fight this guy. I've got to land my own blows while taking the punches. So the obstacle and fear of submitting works to the libraries, just do it. Just do it. The absolute worst that could happen is they could just say no. That's, that's like the worst. Getting, hear, getting ghosted, hearing nothing, that's not the worst. And here's what's not going to happen. Like, I don't want to say it's not never going to happen, but it's unlikely to happen that a library is going to call you up and just say, you are terrible. Stop. You're, you're bad. And, and that was bad. And, and you should feel bad. Libraries aren't going to do that. I mean, they, <laughs> they don't even email you to tell you no sometimes. <laughs> so you think they're going <laughs> to, you think they're going to take the time and energy to, to, to lay waste to you? No, they're just going to move on. They're just going to move on. And that's cool. Yep. Mad about nothing says the worst is never submitting anything and wishing you had. Yeah. What is it? Was it a Michael Jordan quote? You miss 100% of the shots you never take. Yep. When I, here, here's a story. A little, uh, Dave is a little kid story incoming. <laughs> when I was a kid, I was in a little league and I believe it or not, don't let, don't let my six two, 250 pound physique fool you, but I used to be able to run really fast. And so because of that, I was on, uh, in our little leagues, we had like minor, we had T-ball, minor leagues, and major leagues. And I was on the major leagues because I could run fast, believe it or not. But what I couldn't do <laughs> is hit the stinking ball. I was terrible. I was absolutely terrible. But the coaches knew... <laughs> that the pitchers in the little league aren't that great. And so my little league coach told me, do not swing at the ball. Just don't swing at it. You have a higher percentage of getting walked than you do actually hitting the ball and getting on base. So I got walked all the time because little league kids, you know, seven and eight-year-old, nine-year-old kids aren't great pitchers. And so I would get on base and I could, I could steal bases super easily. By the way, this coach also knew the rules inside and out. And he would uh, tell us, when you take your base, when you walk, technically it's a live ball. And he would say, just keep walking, just keep walking to second base. And it was about four games into the season before the other coaches got wise. So I would like, it would be like ball four. And I'd put my bat down and just walk to first base and then just turn the corner. Moving on to second base. <laughs> yep. And I, because uh, once I got onto first, it's live ball and I stole second. Uh, and so, but it, now some uh, 40 45 years later or whatever, I regret never taking a swing, man, because I was told by my coaches not to. So the only way to overcome the fear is just do the reps and keep doing it. Don't get afraid. Don't, you can't live in fear of getting punched in the face. That's the gig. You're a boxer. You're in the ring. You're going to get punched in the face. The real game is for you to land blows while taking, taking your punches. 
Big shout out to uh, Eric. What's good, man? Just gave you a gave you a shout out. Uh, and Stevie B, what is good? Uh, Mad says I have a very punchable face. <laughs> I don't know. We have the same barber, I think. Don't we? Don't we have the same barber? Uh, let's see. Some folks, uh, other other folks in the chat. Um, Shane says, asking for a friend. Um, Ms. Jujubeat says, uh, ask, after constructing and in the process of checking my cues arrangement, are there things that I should make sure it includes? That is a, uh, that, that's a, that's a really big question. I would think, uh, make sure you have, um, editable phrases and layering that an editor can take and it all makes sense, whether it's symmetrical or not. Make sure you have a solid button ending on the on the downbeat following the final phrase. So one chord, hold, ta-da, jazz hands, American Idol, a little ending. I know it might feel cheesy from a creative standpoint, but editors need solid button endings. Um, and uh, just make sure that you're following directions. You know, make sure you're following directions. What's good, Kesher? Really good to see you. Thanks for joining us. Um, Kesher says, I was always taught that you got to roll with the punches or suffer the consequences. That's right. Right. It's not, you're not going to get hit. You just got to know how to take it. Reed asks questions. Composers are increasingly using loops and one shots from Splice and Loop Cloud in their composition. Is it okay to use them or uh, as is, or should you splice them, stretch them, change keys, etc.? cetera? Uh, I, th I think in order to survive in the increasingly content ID'd, Shazammed, sound mouse, all of that, you know, um, it's, it's becoming more important for us to manipulate our samples, right? Uh, what we can't do is just put them naked in there and call it a day. Uh, if you uh, are working with stems, you might be in breach of contract uh, and you, you might violate the terms of service. For example, if you use a splice drum loop, and that's all there is, a splice drum loop, and you stick it on there, and then you are uh, bouncing down uh, alternate versions and stems for uh, for your library, and you give them the percussion-only stem because that's what they're asking for, then you are in violation of Splice's terms of service because what you can't do is redistribute the samples on their own. Now, as soon as you start mangling them, sli slicing them apart, and pitching them and, and beat juggling, then we're okay. But I will always, I will always stack loops. Even if I take like a hi-hat loop and don't do a ton with it, I will layer it with other, other loops um, just to make sure that it's not just all naked by itself. Um, chord progression loops, bass lines, melodies, vocals, those are most likely to trip up content ID algorithms. So I think we got to be super careful with, with those. Uh, and so, um, yep, use responsibly, but I don't think we should hard avoid them. Now I will say splice, not splice, a uh, Serato sample just released Serato sample 2.0, including, um, being able to isolate like the vocal stem and the, the drums and the bass and the, and the, and the other chords and stuff. And uh, that's really exciting because uh, I had a subscription to Serato Studio because that did that. And today I downloaded uh, Serato Sample 2.0, canceled my Serato Studio subscription because Serato Sample 2.0 does stem isolations. And it's pretty darn, pretty darn good. Uh, at the end of the day, though, Reed, I would say check with your library. Some libraries get... Um, some libraries get really sticky about it to the point where they, they will actually add verbiage in their contract saying no splice loops. And so just, just watch out. I did a video a while back on, um, on using splice responsibly and how I feel like splice gets a little unfairly maligned. Uh, I think they, they're kind of the, the punching bag. Um, but yeah, just use responsibly. Let's see. Uh, Linda asks, when reaching out to additional libraries, how long is it reasonable to wait for a response given that you already sent them a gentle reminder some three weeks prior? My feeling is to just move on. Um, well, um, let's see. It depends on how hot the lead was. If it was a cold, unsolicited message and you didn't hear anything back, then um, I will do like a two-week bump. Then I will do a three to four-week bump. Then I will do a six to eight week bump and then maybe a 
six month bump. After then, I think it's time to move on. If it is a warm lead and you have gotten some communication back, uh, I tend to err on the side of optimism, right? Uh, instead of thinking, oh my gosh, the library has totally dropped me and they're terrible and they're they're poorly run, chances are the, the organization is much smaller than we probably think it is. And uh, they might just be busy. Uh, and so um, err on the side of optimism. Um, but if you've signed contracts and all of that stuff, then then that, you know, two, four, six, two, four, six, eight week window gets a little bit more compressed. Um, if it's a, a gentle reminder after three weeks, I would give it another three or four weeks, send them a gentle reminder. And then if you haven't heard anything back, then just move on for sure. Yep, for sure. By the way, thank you guys so much for the questions. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and take a question from the uh, from the 52 Qs community over here. Got a ton of really great questions popping in, but uh, let's see. So um, Jens asks a question which is kind of related to the question we had earlier. Um, how do you handle an increase of loudness during the course of a queue? I usually experience that layering additional instruments step by step leads to a much louder uh, louder end compared to the beginning of the queue. If I'm finally, uh, if I am finally have to set up uh, uh, the luffs to a certain value, I learned to take the loudest part for that. But then often the beginning of the queue feels a little too quiet for me. Is automation of the volume of the stereo out a solution to counteract this effect? Because the production music too drastic dynamic changes over the course of a queue is probably not wanted. In general, you're relatively right. However, it really depends on the type of the queue. Trailer queues can get away with much, much uh, broader um, extremes of dynamics than you would necessarily hear in like a tension queue or especially a sports queue, which has very little you know, dynamic changes. And so it really depends on the type of your queue. I have found, like I said, in 95% of my queues, isolating the loudest portion doing my mix and master from that point gets me the way. The other 5%, yeah, I'm doing I'm doing uh things like what you're talking about, either uh, automating volumes or automating um velocities and that kind of thing. Um the the nuclear option <laughs> the nuclear option is to print it out, right? And then take the waveform and then just increase the uh, the gain of that portion of the waveform. That's how I do a ton of my uh my audio editing, like I'm going to, I'm going to edit this in post. And, uh, if, if like, if I'm rolling a, a piece of music or something like that, then I will just, I'll use, I won't use a fader automation. I'll just increase the waveform. Um, but what I wouldn't do is overly compress. And, um, if the cue calls for it, you might be okay with that. It might be, it might be a feature and not an error. So check with your library first. I would say if it is a, a really delicate cue, you know, and the whole point of it is to have that slow build over time, then the fact that it's really quiet at the beginning might be okay. So I would, I would check with that. Yes. Awesome. Excellent. 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 Jeff asks, a composer's bread and butter is back-end royalties paid out over the course of years or sometimes decade, uh, decades due to a reruns, marathon syndication. In comparison, writing cues for sports is a different animal. How lucrative can sports cues really be if games are not re-aired over many years? No one's watching a game from 2013 at two o'clock on a weekday. Those spots are taken by Housewives and Kardashian reruns. But here's the deal. I don't know why I said it like that. Here's the deal. Uh, here's the deal. Sports can hit network. And regardless of all the streaming, everything we got going on, regardless of whatever network and Peacock versus Hulu versus Netflix versus Paramount Plus, all of those numbers completely pale are towered over by network air. And while yes, I get more over the long term, I get more money off of a placement on Temptation Island than I do a placement on the NCAA tournament. But 
that uh, apples to apples, placement to placement, sports is more lucrative. But here's the other thing with sports. These sports guys and girls, gals, sports producers have a playlist and they love dipping into the same well. Now, I don't have many cues that I wrote in 2015 still making air in reality TV because trends shift. But I still, like last week, I think, got a placement from a cue written in 2015 because the producers, the music supervisors just love the cue and it keeps working its way in and showing up all over the place. So it's, it is a trade-off. It's a trade-off. You're not wrong. Not many people, is, nobody's watching a rerun from two thir- 2013 unless it was a classic episode. Now, the one exception to this was the summer of 2020 during lockdown was uh, they re-ran, they did a rerun of the Masters tournament from the previous year, which just happened to be the year that Tiger won. Uh, and so uh, that, that was pretty lucrative. That was the rare rerun. And if they ever do rerun, like on an ESPN classic, often they're not, they're not rolling the music that was played in real time. But what we're really wanting to do is get good network placements. And that can be, um, that can be really lucrative. At the end of the day, I wouldn't put all of my eggs in sports basket. I wouldn't put all of my eggs in Kardashian's basket. I hope that helps. I'm going to refresh the page here. Uh, next up, we have Michael Sine. Michael Sine asks, a major trend in trailers over the last few years have been cinematic covers or parts of a well-known song integrated into the larger piece. Have you ever used a commercially released track from an artist? If so, was clearing the track affordable? I have never personally done this. Uh, anytime I've ever even seen a brief for like trailerized versions of this cue or that, or this song or that song, the library almost always handles that. Uh, my only experience in this was actually doing arrangements for a jazz duo, uh, jazz vocal duo, and they were putting a, a show together and they wanted to sell an album. And it was, uh, it was all jazz arrangements, think like postmodern jukebox of 80s theme songs. I think that's what it was or 80s music, and then we had a theme song. Mel- so we had a lot of medleys in. And I had one track that was a Michael Jackson medley that had four or five different Michael Jackson songs in one. Well, each one of those required its own independent Harry Fox agency mechanical license at like 35 cents a pop, I think. 35% of cents per unit sold. Back then we were selling CDs. And so you have five songs in one medley. That's five times 35 cents. Then suddenly your profit margin completely evaporates. Uh, And so I just, uh, I just personally have avoided it. I don't really, uh, I don't really get much into it. I don't get much into it. Uh, But if somebody, if anybody here in the chat, or if you're watching this in the archive, if you know, let me know, uh, let me know in the comments but um, in my experience, the library almost always is always going to uh, to handle to handle that. Excellent, excellent, excellent. All right, let's see. Uh, I think that's all the questions from from the cafe. Uh, so uh, Dex asks, uh, if I'm asked to write a two minute cue, how many edit points would you put in, and how uh, and how would you time them? Obviously, it depends on the requests. I tend to put edit points in before uh, or uh, in between major uh, structural changes. So if it's a trailer cue that has an act structure, I would put an edit point uh, in between the acts. If it's your your typical type of um, tension cue that has a build up to around the 50% mark, which is if it's a two minute cue around the minute mark, it could be anywhere between 45 uh, seconds uh, up to a minute and five seconds, right? It's a pretty big, soft landing zone. Uh, I would put a, uh, an edit point of some kind right before the breakdown and then coming out of the breakdown. Not always both, 
but at least coming into the break, going into the breakdown or coming out of the breakdown. Uh, and that those are the, the likely candidates that I start with are uh, the, the main structural points. Not every type of cue requires a, an edit point or as we learned from, uh, from Josh Siegel, editor out in LA, stop downs. I think that's what they call them. That's what the non-composer community calls them, basically all of the editors. And so I try to, I'm trying to, to absorb the term stop down more often. But um, not every cue requires a stop down. Like we don't put stop downs in uh, sports cues, but trailer cues have giant stop downs and horror trailer cues have even more because there's even more editing that gets done with that. See, the reason we put edit points in is so that an editor can go in and insert dialogue and all of that, right? But if it is a sports cue, those get dropped in live, right? It's just needle dropped, needle dropped from the beginning and go. Editors, uh, the, 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 the producers aren't editing that piece of music live underneath highlights. So it needs to be big and strong right from the beginning. So edit points aren't required. In fact, big giant edit points that create builds into a five chord and then nothing and then slant. That actually becomes distraction because there's tons of dialogue going on. And the last thing we want to do is have our sports cue pull focus. And so edit points can do that. It's not to say that we can't have some kind of energetic, you know, contraction and then expansion. We can do all of that, but we don't put them at, whereas a tension cue and a trailer cue, those get heavily edited. Trailer cues have big giant stop downs at the ax. At, at the axe, A-C-T-S, not axe. Uh, they have big stop downs because editors will often cut, slice, insert dialogues, punch lines, whatever, and then go from there. Uh, things like uh, corporate cues, you know, those kind of tasking cues, those types of cues that just kind of roll into the background. Those don't require big um, FedEx truck size edit points. What I mean by that is edit points so large you can drive a truck through them. So yeah, yep. I hope that helped. Great, thanks for the question. Really, really appreciate that. Let's see, Stevie B asks, uh, does BMI or ASCAP track and distribute performance royalties for tracks that are used for advertisements that end up in broadcasts? If those ads are getting reported and cue sheets are getting submitted, then yes. Sometimes, however, ad placements are considered buyouts. And so you'll get a big chunky up upfront um, and uh, they might not necessarily, the ad agency might not be submitting cue sheets for that, but that would depend on the production company. They would need to submit those cue sheets. Otherwise you won't see any back end. And if you're not, then make sure you get pretty chunky front end for that. But that would, that would entirely depend on the, um, that would depend on the production company for sure. Let's see. Uh, Ms. Juju Beats asks, in my opinion, from the list of most requested types of cue, which is the easiest to get started writing? I have yet to write my first cue and there are so many of them to choose from. Well, that is a, that's, that's, that's a loaded question. And so I want to give you the, I want to give you the response that mu a music supervisor or a, a panel of music supervisors gave when they were asked this, I think it was last year, it was either at the road rally or it was, um, it was at PMC. It's all kind of a blur, <laughs> the whole fall, LA twice in six weeks, not never again. Anyway, um, they were asked what's, what kind of cue should I be writing? Uh, and their response was the good kind. <laughs> Basically write them cues that are usable, that sound authentic, good music can find homes. Now, now let, let me give you the less snarky version. I think it's more important to find a type of music that resonates with you as a composer than it is necessarily looking to chase trends. If you write hip hop beats, then find out how you can bend hip hop towards production music. If you are a, an EDM DJ, if you uh, play ukulele, if you're a blues guitarist, if you're a drummer, if you're, if you're a mandolin player, focus on making music 
with the thing you already know how to do and finding homes and finding applications for the thing. Now, what we can't do is we can't just write what we always write and then just Give it and hope it lands. No, we've got to write. This is artisan brain, right? We've got to write with the understanding of somebody needs to be able to use this. And there are some parameters that we should adhere to. Phrasing, layering, buttons, loudness, all of those things. But I think there's a middle ground. And the reason this is important is if you're writing something that is already coming out of your creative self, then it's going to sound more authentic, one. And two, it's going to be sustainable. So if I sit here and say, you know what sells the best hip hop, uh, contemporary hip hop cues and and drill beats, and you're like, I've 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 never I've never heard of drill beats, so I'm just going to go study it. And that might be great, but you might hate writing them. You might hate listening to the reference material. You might uh, hate wrangling 808s, right? But because you're chasing that trend, because that's what is selling right now. And, you know, that that Hansel's so hot right now. Nice, uh, relevant current movie quote for you, for you. You're welcome. But if you're just chasing that trend, then you're not feeling fulfilled. And at the end of the day, I believe that no amount, no amount of royalties are going to overcome just not enjoying the work. I believe. So if you start from what I enjoy doing musically is this, and then it's a matter of finding an outlet for that thing that is production music focused. So that would be my encouragement to you. And I hope, I hope that wasn't, I hope that wasn't a, it didn't come off. I don't mean it snarky or anything. But that's that's what they asked, you know. What's the best type? What what's the best type of music to write? And they said the good kind, because <laughs> authentic music will find a home. Excellent, appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Uh, Linda uh, Deck says I had some cues signed six months later after assuming they had forgotten about it. Yep, just patience, patience. Nigel, uh, real instruments, guitars, ukuleles, percussion are commonly used, but synths are almost always software VSTs. Can you see an advantage in hardware synths for production music composers? I got to tell you, I am way in the minority here, I think, but I don't. I think hardware synths are fussy. I think you are locked in. And um, <laughs> and maybe it's just my lack of experience. I never had a Moog or anything like that. I never had a Phantom. I never had a Juno. I know that there is something to be said about like tweaking knobs and faders and crafting soundscapes in real time. I get that. I am not bent that way. The reason that acoustic instruments work so well and we should focus on recording real instruments is because VSTs can't do that effectively, consistently. But VSTs can 100%, you know, <laughs> recreate oscillators because it's it's just hardware versus software. But at the end of the day, we are in the, uh, in the synthetic domain. And so it's hard to have an uncanny valley <laughs> you know, when it's already artificial and synthetic. But I think there is a, there's a purist elitism that kind of goes along with that, that I don't really buy into, but uh, I, I, I just find hardware sense to be fussy. I mean, and I have, I have a Korg Triton sitting right here, right next to me. And it's got some really cool sounds, but it's, it's kind of a pain in the butt. (laughs) It's a pain in the butt. And then you're locked in and, the issue of an arpeggiator, arpeggiator. I mean, there's something to be said about the uh, the organic quality. You know, if you're using analog circuits, you know, and 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 the longer you use it, then the sound physically changes because the voltage changes and all of that. I get that, but uh, but I I don't have the bandwidth to do that, and I think that's overkill. That having been said. The uh, the dudes that write the uh, Stranger Things soundtrack, I think that's all hardware, and it sounds great. 
it sounds really, really good. And there's probably an authenticity that would be difficult, but not impossible to recreate. Whereas I think it's virtually impossible to recreate virtually um, using virtual instruments, a consistent, believable, like solo ukulele track. That would be really, really, really tough. And you can't, you can't use a loop because that's just a loop of a recording. And as good as Native Instruments strummed guitar is and their electric, all, all of those, they're really, really good. Native Instruments, I see, I see you. You're doing a good job. Keep up the good work. But the Uncanny Valley is real with those. But me grabbing a, a cheap Amazon ukulele and playing it media, <laughs> mediocrely, is that a word? Is going to sound better than a programmed sample library, I think. It's my opinion. But I have tons of respect for the uh, synth tweakers that can do that. I don't have the patience or bandwidth or, or bank account to pull that off. <laughs> Let's see. Shane asks, during all live sports, do they drop in cues on the fly? Does that apply to golf, tennis, football, etc.? Anything that is being dropped live for highlights, whether it's flyovers, uh, whether it's throw to commercials, those are all almost always dropped in live. What's not dropped in live are featured stories. So if they said like, here's a featured story of Rob Gronkowski, you know, making poutine at his house. I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea why I said poutine. Maybe I just need a snack. But, um, and then they throw to a, a pre-tape. Then that's using uh, production music and that is using um, music. And, and often I have found in my experience, it's very rare for my live cues to show up in feature stories because they're different pipelines. They're different pipelines. I mean, it does happen, but um, it's it's rare. And I think it's different producers. It's a different uh, production schedule. It, the, you know, the, the pre-tapes get shot. There's a budget, you know, they're, they're flying to somebody. They're setting up lights, you know, there's mics and all, usually one camera, all that stuff, right? Maybe two cameras with an interview. But when it's live, it's just like, nope, dot, we're going to do it live. Dude in the truck sitting outside of a stadium or producers in a, in a booth uh, in the studio in New York. Yeah, that's all being done live. Uh, and so, um, but golf, tennis, football, in anything that has a live broadcast, uh, they will be dropping in live. That's my experience. Yep. Um, Dex says saxophone, uh, is a nightmare for VST. Yeah. And, and unless you can find a saxophone that does like one thing, a unitasker, like Ember tones, sexy sax, I think it's intended to sound like the, uh, careless whisper. It's intended to sound just like that. <laughs> unless you can find a, a, a library that does the one thing, it's generally pretty tough, tough to find good libraries. All right, I'm going to refresh the page here. That might this might do it. We've been going for a little over an hour, but I do want to uh, make room if anybody else has any questions. Any other questions in the chat? It's been really good hanging out with you guys. Really appreciate you. Uh, Matthew asks, I was wondering at this moment, uh, what would be some effective ways to research and expose my music uh, to the libraries or trailer houses that may be aligned with the cue styles I currently excel in? Well, uh, first thing is, is to just get to Googling. Uh, Google, just, you could go and also uh, chat GPT. But if you want the nuclear option, Head over to pmamusic.org. No, not PMA Music. Uh, pmamusic.com. Let's try that. All right. If you click on pmamusic.com, and I'm going to zoom in nice and tight here, and then click on resources. And if you will go down, you will see the PMA member prefix database or the catalog. And what this gives you is a database of every Production Music Association member. And there are a lot. I mean, look how small that scroll bar is. 
Each one of these represents a catalog, library, subpublisher, label, or whatever. Still scrolling. <laughs> I've been falling for 13 minutes. Yep. Now, they have the, the, the big, you know, they have the, the overall umbrella. But yeah, like, okay, Interpulse. Just Google Interpulse. And first, make sure they take unsolicited submissions. Hear me, hear me. I'm going to go full screen and look dead in your eyes. Not, 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 not you, Matthew, but anybody. Do not send a message to any library, any unsolicited message, unless they specifically put on their website, send us material. If libraries do not have composer submission form, their email available where they say, hey, are you a composer? We'd love to hear from you. If they don't explicitly put that on their website, do not excavate an email address and blast them. Because you know what you're doing? You are telling them right out of the gate, I can't follow directions. <laughs> Is that too real, everybody? I hope not. But that's what you're saying. You're saying that I went around and found an email address and emailed you. They are not happy to hear from you. Again, Matthew, I'm not, I'm not putting you on blast or anything. I'm just saying. But any library who does take unsolicited submissions will put their contact information and indicate, please send us material. So uh, at this moment, what would be the effective way to research? Get to this list. It's really fantastic. And it's just, it's all right there, right? Uh, and, and get to Googling, find a library that resonates with the types of cues you write, and then send them a message. Don't, don't, you know, if you have an album or something, that's cool. You don't have to send them absolutely everything you've ever written. If you have an album, send them a couple and say, I have more if you want them, but uh, don't blast them and then um, give them time to respond. Give them time to respond. And that link is uh, pmamusic.com. And I highly encourage you all to join the Production Music Association. We don't have a guild. We don't have a union. The closest thing we have, especially here in the U.S., is the PMA. These are folks who represent us and to the best of their abilities, go out and represent us to Congress, to the PROs, right? Yep, it's the closest thing we're going to get to having a union or a guild. Uh, and so I encourage you to uh, to join. As, as a matter of fact, they have a, a live stream or a Zoom session coming up uh, this Tuesday. I'll be there. Yep. Yep. Let's see. Uh, some other questions. Uh, Dex asks... Uh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, Dex asked, silly question. Favorite Star Trek character? I'm going with Q. Wow, you are really close. You're really close. I got to tell you, before I started watching the original series, now Shannon and I, Shannon and Mrs. 52 Qs, we are huge Star Trek fans. Huge. Full-on Trekkies, Trekkers, whatever is the appropriate way. Like, absolute Star Trek fans. Strange New Worlds, chef's kiss. Lower Decks, Chef's Kiss. Janeway, Janeway's my captain. I mean, I see you, Patrick Stewart, but I'm a TNG baby. My dad loved the original series, and I, I tried several times to start the original series, and I just couldn't get past it. I was like, oh, the sets are terrible, and oh, it's so bad. It's so slow. I literally fell asleep three or four times. But... Um, I muscled through, Shannon and I muscled through and the original series might be in my top three. It's really good, especially season two. I think it only ran for three seasons, right? Season two is really good. My favorite character, I think is Spock. I think so. He is so good. I, I can't think of, of any other character in the Star Trek universe that became so irre irrevocably intertwined and connected to the character than Leonard Nimoy as Spock. 
Yep. Oh, Dex says that was supposed to be a pun. <laughs> Q, Q. Oh, I see what you did. Yeah, Linder Nimoy Spock. Even though Ethan Peck with Strange New Worlds does a really good job. Miss Juju Beast says Jim Kirk's had, had a, yeah, but oh my, <laughs> I have such a low tolerance for, uh, for William Shatner, if I'm being honest. Uh, I can't handle a lot of Shatner. <laughs> but Leonard Nimoy is fascinating. Uh, he is, he steals absolutely every scene he's in. I, yep. Uh, so, but Q is awesome. Janeway is my captain. All right, let's see. Um, Paul asks, any market for high energy percussion only tracks in sports? Do sports placements give good royalties? Uh, they can give good royalties, especially if you get a nice uh, network placement and a nice long placement. Um, one of the things that can be challenging is, is that the placements can be pretty short and especially with the NFL, how the markets are divided. So uh, if you're not landing a primetime placement, where the whole country is watching, then uh, you might, you know, be, you might get a placement on, you know, Buffalo at Tennessee. And there's a very small sliver of the country actually watching slash caring about that game. Uh, and so um, if, if you can get the big placements, if you can get the larger, uh, the larger n markets, then those can be really good. I have found out that golf works really, really well. And that's one of the reasons I switched over to CSAC from ASCAP because, um, because CSAC was more, more lucrative for me because I wasn't getting like a ton of primetime air, but I was getting like three and four minutes of air, uh, every single week on like the waste management open, you know, or, you know, the AT&T Pebble Beach golf, you know? And so these, these, these shows or these broadcast, which had long placements, but they weren't in prime time. And so that was, um, that was one of the reasons that I went, but as far as percussion only tracks, not from my publishers, they're not necessarily, I think they would take them, but, uh, those tend to be used more for, uh, sports advertisement, uh, than necessarily like just kind of backgroundy stuff. Excellent, excellent. Uh, Matthew says, uh, thank you, Professor Croft. Looking forward to the mastermind. Yep, next mastermind will be in January. So be on the look, look out for that. Yuka says, every time I watch your video, always curious, what's the studio look like? Maybe in the future, show your studio a little bit. Believe it or not, I have on the schedule uh, to do a studio video. See, I want to do it right. I don't want to just like walk, the, I want to shoot B-roll and all of that stuff and take you through take you through the studio for sure. But that that's coming. That's coming. And Shane says, uh, what a singing voice those two had. Uh, do you mean uh, Leonard Nimoy? And Nichelle Nichols also had a really good singing voice. Really good singing voice. All right. All right. Well, I think, I think that's going to need to do it for us today. Guys, thank you so much for hanging out with me. Oh, Shane says Shatner and Nimoy. Uh, it was really great hanging out with you today. Really appreciate you. Actually, I should probably, I should probably, no, I'm going to leave this cue on because if I'm editing this with the podcast and then the podcast theme, but whatever, whatever. Uh, Dex says, uh, thank you for your time. Uh, Picard was the right answer. No, nope. Every, everybody says Picard, but no, Picard is, 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 is good. Don't get me wrong, but here's what will blow your mind. Will Wheaton now is older than Patrick Stewart was, is, is older now than Patrick Stewart was when he started. Uh, but yes, oh, you're very, very welcome. Really appreciate you, but that's gonna do it for us. Thank you so much. Once again, a huge shout out to the family, friends, and patrons of 52Qs who really make all of this, all of this possible. Appreciate you, love you, and uh, why don't you join us? Head over to 52Qs.com and uh, join us. You can uh, post your cues up for weekly feedback. And also, uh, you can check out uh, my coaching services at 52Qs.com slash coaching. And I would love to help you out, whether it's giving you feedback videos, doing one-on-one -on -one Zoom sessions, or or um, our mastermind, which is uh, coming to a close. We only have one more month left in the summer mastermind. But uh, be on the lookout for the next Q&A, uh, probably in, uh, in December. But that's going to do it for us, everybody. Thank you so much. And uh, I hope you have a fantastic rest of your week. And remember, everybody, that I know and believe that the universe has amazing plans 
just for you. Until next time, peace. The 52 Cues podcast is copyright 2023 at 818 Studios, all rights reserved. The music played on the podcast is copyright of their respective owners and is used with permission and for educational purposes only. For more information, including joining the community and submitting your cue for consideration on the podcast, head over to 52cues.com.